Hey, this is Avante. I'm Eli, and this is hosted by Posh. An intimate series where we talk with the most influential people in the event space and hear about the movements they've built. Today we're sitting down with the organizers of We Belong Here. Centered around sophisticated, music-driven experiences in unique settings around the world, We Belong Here is one of the fastest growing event planning groups in the US. Their productions range from a Halloween celebration at the former New York Stock Exchange to a 6,000 person festival on Miami's Virginia Key Beach. Not only have they worked with major artists like Lane 8, Cascade, Nora and Pure, and Purple Disco Machine, but they also book more upcoming and local artists than any festival we've seen. Avante and I have known you guys for a few years now, but for all the people that are watching, let's rewind and get into how each of you individually kind of got into the nightlife space and what initially propelled you into throwing events. Maybe start with Justin, like what were you doing initially? Like how'd you get into the space and everything? Yeah, so I loved like music my whole life. I think, you know, my parents have told me stories of like when I was four years old, I would grab like random things in the house and like line up like my parents and like any family that was over and like force them to like watch me put on a concert. So I think I was like a promoter from like a very, very early age. <laughs> but um, what I really got into it was in college. Um, I joined a fraternity and, you know, partying and events was a big part of that. But I wanted to bring an element of music into what we were doing. So I ran for philanthropy chair of my fraternity. And this was like right during the EDM bubble. So kind of, you know, my speech for running for philanthropy chair was like, we're going to throw a big EDM party and we're going to raise a ton of money for charity. And this is going to be super fun and cool. And that's what we did. And, you know, it was in some ways a horrible failure, but in other ways it was like really cool and awesome. So learned a lot from it. And who'd you guys book? We booked Henrix. Henrix. Yeah, okay. he had like a big song at the time called Hit It. I was just like, I just need a DJ with a song on YouTube that has a million views and I'll sell this party out. And we did sell the party out. So, so why that, was it a failure? We incited a riot on campus. Okay. Almost got the fraternity kicked off for the semester. It was a paint party also. So like everything was like an absolute mess. Like throwing a paint party indoors was something we were not prepared for. Um, so I kind of learned then, like marketing, I'm really good at, and operations, like yeah, maybe not so much. And that's when you met Charles, or <laughs> no, not, not then, but you know, I think that always, like when you know, partnering with someone or going into trying to do something in this business, I've always felt like you know, marketing, like I can crush that, but like I need someone on my team and in my corner that really like has the operations down and like you know is willing to kind of do what it takes to make the operations successful because i just know myself and i know that that's not me from my perspective it seems like you are heavily involved in operations day to day for we belong here though is that not the case yeah definitely i mean i try and be involved as much as i can but i think where i come into operations more is i try and put myself more in the shoes of the fan and i try and think about things from you know we're marketing this a certain way and promising people something so we need to make sure that our operation lives up to the way that we're marketing the event mm -hmm. i think that's the way i come into operations meetings more whereas charles is like really like making decisions and coordinating things and kind of down to like the smallest detail you talk a lot about like the fan uh, and a lot of like kind of just when we were speaking before and marketing materials and things. Where do you think like the fan has kind of been forgotten about for like other festivals? Definitely like when it comes to room to dance, especially in like this is dance music. This isn't rock and roll. This isn't country. This is dance music. So when you have these amazing events with incredible game changing production, the biggest artists in the world, and you just don't have the room to actually dance. Sometimes it has like me personally questioning like, like why, why am I here? As opposed to our company, which is literally called We Belong Here and you know, wanna feel like you're just like really able to enjoy yourself and, and let loose. Even if like the production and certain things aren't on like the highest level, it's I think the little details that actually make more of a difference of like having fun and being able to connect with the people around you, which is also so important for what we do. It's like when, when you're in college or just graduating college, 
you're excited to be at any event, go to any party, it doesn't matter how crowded it is, how shitty the production is, like you're just excited to be out drinking, socializing, having a good time. But as you get older and you're getting more mature and you're able to frequent more of, you know, the hot spots and the uh, most respectable venues, you really start to, you know, uh, develop a taste for what's good, what's not. And even some cream of the crop venues that have the best production, the best DJs, it's amazing show, but is it an amazing party when you are shoulder to shoulder? When it takes 30 minutes to fight your way out of a crowd to get a drink, to go to the bathroom, you can't dance. Like yeah. Justin said it perfectly. This is dance music. This isn't stand shoulder to shoulder and just hold your phone up and just watch a screen. Like this is dance music. We want to throw dance parties. We want people to have space. We want people to, you know, live their life, talk, dance, not like be fighting for room and just squeeze like an you're an ant in an ant hill. Totally. And you, and you started, started as a DJ? Yeah, so I would say before even DJing, it's funny because Justin and I both share this from, from years back, like middle school, early high school. I think before even the DJing, we, we both rapped. We, we, yeah, we, that's we a were, really funny thing that we have in common. Really? We were aspiring to be, you know, white Jewish rappers. We didn't even know each other, <laughs> but like our passion was for rap and music and dance music, sure, but like it is funny that we both had an affinity and we gravitated towards rap music. And then, yeah, me personally, I started, you know, DJing. Uh, proms and school charity events and bar mitzvahs and whatnot and then college you know frat tailgates and the bars and that led me to New York City during the summertime where Justin was running programming for a bunch of great venues in New York City in the Hamptons he was running marketing and whatnot and he booked me for a bunch of events and I mean Justin usually tells it best about the first time we really, really met. Yeah. Um, it was probably love at first sight, but I want to stop you really quickly. <laughs> I want to know what your alias was when you were a rapper. It's my alias was the same as my DJ alias. It was Sir Chaz. Sir Chaz. And I, yours? I went by Big JD. Big JD. <laughs> yeah, and you could look it up on YouTube. I put out like four albums of, four of music. Albums. Yeah, produced every track. Like wow. wow. Yeah. What happened? I just kind of lost the the passion for it. It kind of didn't feel. I was drawn to hip hop at like a younger age because I think I liked the rebelliousness of it and like I liked the creativity also like the way that it incorporated old music and flipped things into samples also producing it was very I don't want to call it easy but it was very raw like all you needed to do was like have like one riff or find one cool snippet and you could flip it and turn it into to something so at the time I was very like drawn to that um, but I think as I got older, like the experiences that I had at dance music concerts versus the experiences that I had at hip hop shows, mm -hmm. I just had such a better time experiencing dance music that that led my taste to change so much so that now I listen to probably like 90% dance music and maybe wow. like 10% other music, w including hip hop. Do, that, do you ever that, think like We Belong Here would have other genres outside of dance music? Definitely. I mean, like, I think, you know, slowly, we, we want to really focus on like dance music and live electronic. Um, I think it has to be tasteful, but at the end of the day, good music is good music and it's universal. But to Justin's point, I completely agree with like, when we were old enough to start actually going to events, going to concerts, it's like these hip hop artists, you, you could just tell that 90%, I won't say all of them, some of them definitely do, but 90% just, they don't care about the fan experience that much. They're very more like selfish internal. They show up when they want, they'll show up 30 minutes late. They'll do four or five songs and call it like with dance music and DJs, you know, they're, they're DJing and curating a set that a, you know, the quality is going to be great because it's like a, a recording of the music. And it's not, you know, a lot, like a lot of these hip hop artists super fucked up when they perform and, they just don't value the fan experience in general as much as dance music artists and DJs. It feels like there's a lot of self-centered energy in hip hop and granted yeah. there's a lot of amazing artists that don't project that and really have like deep introspective lyrics but I think at this point like when I'm like going out and when I'm partying like and I think the city has kind of gravitated and followed this trend too that um, 
dance music is really more what I want to listen to and the type of hip hop that I'm drawn to isn't so much like the club bangers and I mean if you throw on a great 50 cent song or figure out like that's always going to pop off but like the introspective like lyrical hip hop that isn't meant for the clubs that's kind of the stuff that I'm like more yeah. drawn to it's like Russ J. Cole like artists like that yeah. so we know for both of you space is a huge like indicator of a great event the overall vibe the respect for the artist from the fans and also the respect from the artist to the fans um, you find Virginia Key Park you're both in Miami massive crazy plot of land zero infrastructure how do you go from a blank field to thousands of people at a huge festival? Like, what's the first step you take? Is it daunting? Are you nervous? I mean, the biggest, I think the biggest challenge was like, Justin and I both came from years of, you know, doing the typical organizer, promoter, partnering with existing venues with infrastructure. Um, so it was definitely a huge learning curve and a, and a really great experience, but you know, step one, obviously, just find the venue, figure out all necessary things that come with that venue. Do you need permitting with the city of Miami? Is it a city-owned venue? Yeah. What type of insurance do you need? You know, what type of fencing do you need to bring in? What type of bathrooms and Wi-Fi and electricity and generators and heavy equipment to set up, you know, all the staging and whatnot? Um, I How think do you learn that, by the way? Like you just figure it's, it out as you go? Yeah, it's, it, there's really no manual. It's just experience. It's just, mm. you know, talking with the venue. We got a lot of help and guidance from the special events coordinator at the venue mm. um, saying, you know, here's, here's a list of everything that you need to do to comply with the city. Here's a list of everything you need to do to comply with the police department. Here's a list of everything you need to do to really just like cover your ground of the basics of making sure you can throw a safe, successful event. Mm. Um, and it's just experience, you know, like you just have to throw yourself in it. It's definitely a lot of things that came up last second that we weren't necessarily prepared for in year one, that year two, you know, this couple of weeks ago that yeah. we were ahead of the game on. But to answer your question, it's really just experience. Wow. What, what made you pick Virginia Key Beach? Simple, just A, it's a land, it's, it's a, uh, it was added to the National Registar Registry of um, Historic Venues. It was one of the first beaches in Miami that uh, was open to African Americans in the early 1900s as a place dedicated just for them. Um, and just, it's so naturally beautiful. Like there's such few venues that you have a prime waterfront where people can literally dance with their feet in the water while they're seeing a show and seeing a performer. It was awesome, yeah, yeah. I had a great experience. There was you like played a, on the beach, right? No, no, they put me at the kind of worst stage, but uh, you know. It's a it's a but uh, but I uh, definitely wouldn't call that the worst stage. But um, yeah, essentially, my first year though, there was a picnic table um, in the water, and at high tide, uh, it essentially came. The water came about six inches below the top of the picnic table, and I was just laying there listening to the beach stage and just thinking, this is an amazing festival, um, and you know. I think that was just, yeah, I don't know. It, it definitely kind of showed the fruits of your labor. So I don't know if you guys put that picnic table there or not. But. I didn't, I didn't honestly didn't even know about that. If I had, I, I looked for it this year. It wasn't, year. it wasn't there, unfortunately. But, so uh, to go back to the experience part, if for the 17 year old kid that's watching right now, super passionate about music, loves space and dance music like you guys did, um, where, where do they get started if they want to also throw their own festival and they have a really niche idea that has a specific sound and vibe to it? Where, where do they go? I would say start small mm. and work your way up. And I think something that we had to learn is that it doesn't make you less ambitious to start smaller and work your way up. And you know, there's times where I think we wish that we maybe took smaller steps to get where we were and didn't jump into it so head first but at the same time that's just you know not who that's not who we are and you can't look back and you can't do things differently you can only move forward um but you know i think at that age and people who are young it's better to do something at a smaller scale and to work your way up gradually and have the big idea and believe in the big idea and believe it's possible and go after it with everything you have but don't just jump right into it learn do things and i think building a network building trust building a reputation those things are so important i think that 
the amount of smaller events that we did before starting We Belong Here is a big reason that we were able to pull off the, the types of things that we've done, whether it's you know selling out Cipriani in advance, 66 VIP tables, 1,300 people, or you know even getting 5,000 people to Virginia Key in our first year when we announced the festival in the middle of a pandemic resurgence with only two months to sell the event, or you know getting 12,000 thousand people there total this year with another year to work on it we're able to do that because we've you know built relationships along the way it's not it's really not about us at all it's really about everyone that comes together to make it happen and i think the way that we've treated people along the road before we started we belong here and leading up to it has you know people have given us the benefit of the doubt that when we say we're going to do something awesome or when we say that you know we're going to to do something amazing but it's going to take a little bit of time or whatever that might be people believe us because of all of the work that we put in before we got to this point from like the i guess artist perspective right that's great advice for someone trying to throw events but you guys are obviously tastemakers in the dance music space you guys are deciding who gets, who gets airtime um so if there's someone who's an aspiring you know dj and they wanted to get airtime at an awesome event like we belong here uh a point of contention i think is that you guys would have an interesting opinion on is should they go after the dj and production side and the musical element first or the promotion side and building an audience first because promoters care so much about ticket sales but you also don't want someone someone up there who's not musically gifted so what do you guys value more when you're booking you know for these kind of side stages i think it's really for us about both because right now we're at this stage of the game one of our biggest focuses is on selling tickets but we also do have you know, long-term goals and aspirations ourselves. So music curation and building a reputation for only booking the best artists is so important. So I think our perspective on it kind of goes hand in hand with the way artists should view it. If you're able to bring 100, 200 people somewhere, but you're not providing value musically, that will get you through certain doors. But if your end goal is music, then the doors that that gets you through might take you on the wrong type of path. And not everyone's end goal is music. Some people just wanna live in the moment and be able to play for a really big crowd and have fun. Other people are just, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a great DJ and yeah. just being a DJ and not producing music. It's just different for what everyone wants. But I think for us, what we look for is people who have dedicated themselves to music and have shown just a little bit of a sign that their artist project is going to go somewhere. And we don't need to see a lot of it. It could be one track. It could be one really unique mix that they've put out there. It could be one party that they played that they just did something so creative and unique that we saw and went to. But there needs to be a little something that we can see and we could be like, okay, I can see this person going somewhere and going somewhere that us as a brand want to go in as well. And it's just passion too, like, you know, if there's a there's an act who's like yeah I'll book one or two 10k tables and do this and do that, and they're not the worst DJ but they're not the best but like they're just kind of like cold hearted. It's like we we have to feel the passion that they love the music that they're in it for the right reasons. Yeah. It's like they just want the clout only, and their music's not great. It's kind of like. Nah. But when, when people care about the music, when people care about community, when people like genuinely care about every person that shows up to their smaller shows, that's the type of stuff that leads to being able to sell tickets and being able to get people there. So it's kind of those types of things, like what community have you built as an artist? Because dance music especially is like about bringing people together is a really big part of it. So if you're, if you make great music, but your music isn't capable of bringing people together, how great is your music? Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, I, I would just echo that and say less so about the production side of a DJ producer, more so like how passionate are they about bringing people together, curating, introducing people, like-minded people to each other and just like, you know, trying to make the world a better, vibier place. That's what we want to do. We want to make the world a better and a vibier place. And so a DJ that wants to make the world a better, vibier place, right, but doesn't necessarily know you guys personally, 
what is the best way for them to stand out and show someone like yourself or anyone they're trying to get booked by hosting amazing experiences, you know, that little difference that they have or that community that they've built? Well, for We Belong Here, we started something called the Artist Spotlight Program where people can submit a mix and basically get on our radar and get on the team's radar. We'll listen to the mix, we'll play it while we're doing work or, or whatever it might be. And then, you know, if it catches our attention, we'll look up the artists, see what other stuff they're doing, what type of music they've put out, what events they've played. Really trying to give everyone like a, a fair shot at being a, at being a part of it because I think that for us to build a community the size that we want to, if we only went through like the friends of a friend or the personal connections, it limits us into being a smaller sphere than we, when we take people who we have no direct connection to. That actually helps to make the community something really big and, and something really powerful. Yeah, I think out of the uh, 50 side stage artists, about four or five of them were actually through the, the Artist Spotlight oh, program. Wow. Maybe a little bit more actually. So just based on their mix, you wanted them to? It wasn't, it wasn't only based on their mix. Like, like That's the first impression. It's a we, chance, right. that's, that's the handshake. That's we the chance about, to say hello. I think we had 35 or 40 submissions. And you know, there were probably ha over half the submissions were great mixes, great music. Mm. But it's like, we took a look at their socials. We contacted them. We had a little bit of conversation with them over email or text, got a feel for, you know, what, what's your true motive. And based on a combination of all three factors, because again, we had about 35, 40 submissions and most of them were good. Yeah. Um, but it's like, you can weed it out by just a looking at their socials, seeing like, what are they posting about? Like, what's important to them? What do they want to present? And also just talking to them and getting a feel for, okay, we looked at your socials, but what's beneath the yeah. surface? So you guys have done three incredible, massive shows now. You, had, you started with the Cipriani one, now you've done two in Miami. Let's fast forward three years from now, where is We Belong Here? What does it look like? What's the experience I have when I go to one of your marquee events? I think a few years from now, we're hopefully in a few different cornerstone markets and you know, our bigger festivals can be somewhat of a, a seasonal gathering for, mm -hmm. for the community that, that loves, you know, feel good music, that loves to socialize and experience music in a setting that's outside of a nightclub or outside of a, a warehouse. These are kind of like the big meccas that are bringing those people together and really like showing off the, what we belong here is capable of and really just trying to innovate the experience year over year for people, give people something new every year. And then in addition to that, we're hopeful to have a, a nice series of smaller events in really cool, unique locations that whether it's the core of our community or maybe it's something that is just so unique and cool that it catches someone's attention and that's what brings them into the community. We're, we're really hoping to kind of line that up where you're going throughout the calendar year. And this brand isn't something for the person that's trying to go out and party every single weekend and every single night. Not to say that if you do that, that you can't be a part of this community, you definitely can. And there's a lot of people who are that love to go out all the time, but we created this brand. Charles is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> we created this brand to throw the type of parties that we wanted to go to. We're in our 20s now, but we wanted to throw the parties that we felt like we were still going to want to go to when we were like 40 years old. So mm. that's, you know, with everything we do, we're trying to not do something that we feel like we can grow out of. We're trying to do something that is lasting. That, and I think by changing and by growing, that's part of the way that we can accomplish that. But everything we do is really geared towards, you know, this can be a healthy part of a well-balanced life. And we really believe that going out and partying and socializing in certain ways actually can be a healthy part of a well-balanced life. And I'm, I'm, I really, really believe that. And I, I really struggled to decide if I felt that way, like during the pandemic when everything was shut down and you know, experiencing, oh wow, this is like, you know, not having three club events every weekend. Like well, this I mean, is actually the, really awesome. The options in some were ways. kind of like anti what you would want to go to. It's like in a basement, crowded, shoulder to shoulder, dark, you know? Yeah, that was exactly what our main user base was in the pandemic. <laughs> um, okay, so you want to be partying when you're 40. So here's an interesting question. Would you let your kids go to a rave and at what age? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think it just depends on, um, depends on the, the circumstances of, of what it is. But if it seems like it's a safe, like, well-run event, you know, like, 
I don't know, a middle school dance is a dance music event. Like, what's the difference between that and a, a well-organized, you know, concert or, or rave? It just really depends on the, the type of setting and what the, what the vibe is. But, you know, where with We Belong Here, we're not really focused on, like, how can we bring dance music culture to, like, you know, younger kids. I, I think that would be awesome if maybe someone could come into the market and figure out, like, a safe, like, healthy way to, to do that. But, you know, for us, it's definitely focusing on, like, an older, more mature crowd. 25 to like 45 is kind of our core demographic. We start the festival at 21 plus, so like you can't even come unless you're 21. So outside of the festival, you guys said you're doing a bunch of smaller events this year. Um, we have a lot of organizers watching that are in a super concentrated market, especially New York, LA, Miami. Everyone's competing over overlapping audiences. When you're going for a, a smaller event, and Charles, you're more on the operations side, what are some of the things that you have to watch out for in terms of when the competitors are throwing, how their marketing is, what audience they're going after? How do you approach a smaller event in a really concentrated market? Definitely. I mean, I think the programming, you know, it's like if there's massive events in a certain type of drama genre, we'll try and, you know, be the program our, our music a little bit counter to what those big events are. But again, we really don't feel like there is that much competition because we are trying to do something so unique. We'll never do a warehouse. We'll never do a standard nightclub. We'll never do a parking lot. Like each venue we choose, we choose it because we think that it has something beautiful and unique to offer to our guests and attendees. Um, and then we know our programming is unique and you know, between both of our tastes and what we like, it's like, we're gonna put together a lineup of music that's gonna be different and it's gonna appeal to different people. But I think, again, most important factor is the setting. Interesting. And it's like, you can go to your favorite venue with the sickest lights, yeah. the best audio, the best DJs, Tiesto, David Guetta, John Summit, this, that. And if your surrounding is not comfortable and fun and if you don't have space to dance, fuck that. Totally, totally. So it's like we, we're trying to make it so that every person knows that a We Belong Here event will have space to dance, will be unique programming with the music, yeah. and it will have other diverse and, and uh, eclectic offerings besides just you know music, an LED screen, lights, and there'll be more to do, more to so, experience. So you guys are very particular about location and who you guys are booking. So it's funny you say John Summit. Would you ever book John Summit? Yeah, we definitely would. You would book John Summit? Yeah, definitely. You don't think he's too bro house or anything like that? I think the new music that he's been putting out has been really great as I'm a big fan of Melodic House and I've definitely seen how Tech House has been like a movement that's swept New York City. I think the way that he's brought like deep vocals and, and great melodies into kind of like the Tech House scene I think is really innovative. I, I think the music that he puts out is very different than like the image and what he portrays. But I think that, you know, at the end of the day, even though there's a lot of like, you know, get fucked up every day, I definitely think that people are more drawn to him because of like the, the free spirit and like the positivity of uh, what he's doing. So, you know, we're actually, funny enough, we're putting in an offer for him for something really cool we have today, wow. literally. Really? So yeah. we'll see, uh, you know, wow. maybe, maybe, he'll, really maybe he'll accept it. Smaller me. scale, not, not a festival, but. Um, well, I'll be screaming where you are until my okay. lungs break. And, but, but to go off of, of that question, it's like, Something that has definitely bugged me, and I know it's bugged Justin as well, it's like, we do our programming where we try and find the best of underground and mainstream electronic music, yeah. but something that really upsets both of us is, especially re in the last couple of years with the tech house scene and, and the deep house scene, there's a lot of core fans that are very snobbish and very, oh, like, David Guetta's playing, like, I won't go, like, Good music is good music, and, and these guys are pioneers, and it's like both of us are just very upset that there's so many people that are so close-minded to certain artists, and even artists that we love and have submitted offers to, it's like, oh, I can't play at this time because this artist is right before me. And we know that it would be a great party, a great flow musically. And these are like two artists that like, in a DJ set, like I'll play their songs back to back. Like, And they're both like deep house artists, but, there's like different sub genres of deep house. Like 
tech and melodic and this, that. And some people just have such egos where it's like, oh, like I can't be next to that artist. I don't even know that it's, I don't even know it's the artist, honestly. It might be the management team or the agent. There's so many layers before it maybe even gets to the artist yeah. that there's people who are trying to direct careers in a certain direction. It might not even be the artist that's like even hearing that this is an option. So right. definitely don't want to like, you know, throw shade yeah, at any, definitely. I, yeah. I, I, my guess would be it probably has a lot more to do with the, the industry. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Really nice. So you guys are, uh, you did this from the ground up. You didn't have any funding to begin with. Take us through, you have this massive festival. Like you said before, you have this list of production costs that the venue gave you. Where do you start in terms of fundraising? Well, we started the company during like the pandemic. So this was a time where there really wasn't a lot of entertainment going on and um, people kind of felt that the entertainment industry was going to boom. So I think that played to our advantage maybe more than we even realized at the time. Like I think if we could have gone back to that moment that there was a very special moment when it comes to like fundraising and where the state of the world was at that we wish we would have capitalized and taken more advantage of and kind of thought about like the next five years as opposed to in this moment. But we also very much felt like we were testing a new concept and that we wanted to prove ourselves. So we went out and we fundraised event by event as opposed to raising equity in the actual company. Partially, I think, and I regret this a little bit, but I think partially because we were scared that it wasn't going to work. And you know, we, sell, we sold out Cipriani and we made a, a great profit on it. So that was kind of like that moment where it was like, okay, like let's be aggressive with the things that we set out to do. But in hindsight, I think we should have had more confidence in the brand and in the idea and just said, you know what, let's right now, while the world is shut down, let's raise a few million for the company and let's you know, go out and plan the next five years and just absolutely you know, build out this vision without, without any constraint, even if it meant, up, meant giving up a really large part of the company at the beginning. I think if we would have found the right partners and the right people who believed in the vision at that time, that that would have been like a really, a really great thing to do. But instead we went out and we raised money event by event and we've done that up until this point. So let's, let's dig into that. You're raising money specifically for an individual event. Is it like a startup where you have a pitch deck for the event or what, what are the materials that you have to come up with? Are there, spe are there investors out there that are specifically event investors or did you approach tech and finance investors that were interested in events on the side? How does it work? Yeah, we approach everyone and it's like models on models on models till you get you know, something that looks good to investors but is also realistic and not you know, shooting for the moon and just kind of BS and it's like, then it's decks on decks on decks and it's getting feedback. But to answer your question, just a wide net, like we didn't really discriminate. We didn't just try and go only towards our network in the nightlife and event industry. Like yeah. we went to, you know, friends and family and, and got connections that they recommended in finance and tech and whatever it is, we, we pitched everyone and anyone. And it's like, you kind of have to do that when you're starting out. You can't be picky because like you never know what a conversation with someone is going to lead totally. to what doors that's going to open to. Was every investor uh, like a referral or someone you knew or did you have any cold leads you reached out to that wrote a check? I think for the most part, it has some way come through our network. And I think that goes back to touching upon like the amount of events and things that we were part of before starting We Belong Here that I think that's kind of what gave us the credibility where, you know, friends of a friend or a connection through this person had heard good things about us because we had clientele and we had people that we cared about and took care of for, for many years with many different kinds of events before we started this. So, you know, if someone felt inclined to spend a certain amount of money a year on tables at of different events that we were throwing and also like, these weren't events that Charles and I were throwing together necessarily. Like there were some things where our paths crossed, but a lot of this is like separate. Like Charles was doing his thing. I was involved in, in other things as well. But a lot of that credibility that was built, if someone's willing to spend a certain amount on, you know, just bottle service to go to an event, yeah. I, I, that person, a lot of times I think would be willing to say, you know what, why don't I just invest into this event and invest into this company? So I think a lot of you know, people like that, as well as people who have had experience investing into different hospitality event ventures, like you know, owning um, a promotional group or owning a, a bar or investing into a club, something like that. People who have had a little bit of experience in, in the industry and thought that like what we were doing was interesting and unique. 
And so we have experience with like startup investing or I guess startup fundraising, right? Where someone's putting in a check for equity in our company uh, and we really have no financial risk other than you know a reputation that's on the line uh, if the business goes under. I know it's a little bit different for you guys, right? You weren't raising for equity. So how, what were these deals structured like? What would someone get in return for writing you guys a check? I mean, some, sometimes it was just for equity in a specific event. And sometimes- Like a profit stake in, right. in the event. And then other times we've needed to, you know, do loans tied to receivables. We've needed to do kind of like really anything possible to get the amount of capital to make the event happen has kind of been, you know, as we've ventured more down the path of doing festivals, which is very capital intensive, um, and a little bit more capital intensive than I think we've realized when we first set out to say, like, we're gonna, you know, throw an intimate music festival. We were more focused on, well, Ultra's 50,000 people, we're gonna do something for 5,000 people. This must be, you know, pretty small and inexpensive, but that definitely wasn't the, the what case. Kind of, what kind of collateral were you guys putting up? Like, what does an event brand have as collateral? I mean, ticket sales, some some deals, you know, Justin and I personally guaranteed them to how much we believed in it, to how much we, you know, wanted it to happen because we know that after the fact, there's gonna be people that see what we're trying to do and the vision that we're trying to make come to life. And, you know, that is the case. And now we are at the stage where after three pretty big events, we're ready to go out and raise for equity in our company. And we've also, when we were doing like event by event financing, we also would take as individuals the same deal that we were going out and pitching to investors. So I think that inspired a lot of confidence in people because you know, it's like, this isn't just Charles and I started an LLC and here's the event, we're raising money for it. It's like, I, you know, I've invested pretty much every single dollar I have to my name into this company and Charles has invested probably more than, than I have into this company. Mm -hmm. And we've done that in the same way that we've gone out and pitched people to invest in this. So, we might not have like the collateral to literally say like your investment is collateralized by this or that, but it's collateralized by the fact that we're in this with you as individuals and win or lose, we're going to win and we're going to lose together. And that's, you know, the most we have is kind of just that mentality and giving it everything we have. Respect. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and just, you know, one note to, uh, that I wish I could have told myself three, four years ago to anyone trying to fundraise or make something come to life financially is, you know, it's very easy to, to network and add 20 people to your contacts every week or make an effort to just meet someone and add them to your contacts, but it's a whole different ball game to then actually make an effort to maintain that relationship. Mm -hmm. And even more so to try and like add value to them, you know, make intros for them with whatever they have going on with businesses or whatnot, or just someone that you think they should be introduced to because it could add value to them in any way. It's like just being a good person and genuinely caring about the contacts that you meet will come full circle. And I think, you know, that's something Justin and I try to do and we're trying to be better every day is like not just networking and adding X amount of people to your contacts every week, but actually like every month checking back in with them saying, hey, how's it going? Oh, cool, really? Like, there's this person you should meet that would, I think, you know, there could be synergy between you two. And like, just doing that with more people will come around and have an ROI. Well said, yeah. I know Avante and I have had similar experiences when you really befriend the investors that are backing you. Yeah. Um, the possibilities are just endless compared to just trying to get a check from someone. And um, especially too, like our company is all about community building. So yeah. the investors are, kind of the foundation of the community in a lot of ways, because what we're doing wouldn't be possible without the money they're putting into it. But also, you know, there's more to it than just putting in the money and the, the type of energy that comes along with the investment kind of radiates throughout everything that we do. So a lot of the investors that have, you know, been a part of this have really done a lot to, to help the event, whether it's just bringing their friends, posting about it on social media, making a connection to a, you know, a, a sponsor, like yeah. We Belong Here really isn't very much about Charles and myself. It's really about every single person that believes in it. And we're kind of just the ones that are waking up every day to coordinate the effort of these hundreds of people that believe in this vision and are a part of it in some way with the investors being like really an essential part of that. You guys mentioned community a lot. Clearly you had to innovate on the fundraising side and you guys got super creative with that. 
On the marketing side, you've also been very innovative, especially this year. I noticed that you took more of the route where we belong here is more than just an events brand. Um, you guys obviously have the merchandise channel and other ways you're, you're making money, but you also had some like short form content where people were getting interviewed on the festival grounds. I know that's kind of your bread and butter, Justin, but do you want to speak into A, like what We Belong Here did for marketing and B, how it's different from some of the larger festivals we've seen like Ultra. I've never seen a TikTok from Ultra where they're doing cool interviews like that. Yeah, so I, I think with We Belong Here, we are trying less to sell tickets and more to sell a gateway into a community mm -hmm. and that the experience is your first step into something bigger than just an event and just an experience. So with every marketing asset that we put out, with everything that we put onto social media, every you know ad that we've run, it's really trying to communicate our value proposition and it's not just that we have all of these great artists. We're really trying to show and tell that this isn't going to be the same thing as seeing the same lineup on some other flyer. Going to see these artists at a We Belong Here experience is going to be very different. And not only the performance from the artist is going to be different, but it's going to be an opportunity to meet new people and make friends with people who have similar tastes in music, which is something that I feel less and less as I've gotten older is something that I can do when I go to a music festival or when I go to like a big concert or a club event. Mm -hmm. So We Belong Here is definitely a place where you know you can do that and we try and have that radiate throughout all of our digital marketing and then as well as just other forms of marketing too, um, you know, promotion and brand ambassadors and, and things like that. It's the community that ultimately sells the community better than anyone else. So by making the community as big as possible and just building those relationships and really, you know, not just speaking with a prominent promoter in Miami and saying you can make this percent or that percent, but taking the time to actually explain what we belong here is, what we're trying to do, how we're not, you know, coming into the market trying to be the next this or the next that, but we just have something that we believe in and also working and paying more attention to the people who kind of resonate with what we're saying and having that be the foundation of of our marketing. So it's really, you know, it's digital and it's community based, um, but the two work hand in hand and really at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to how we communicate with people to show them that we're something that is worth their time. I think, I think community is very important, but I think it does have some, somewhat of a snowball effect, right? Where like at the beginning, it's not necessarily as strong as it is today. I'm sure you guys could go on sale and have me and Eli DJ and you're gonna sell a couple tickets at least. Uh, but like at the first day, you had no community, right? You just had your personal networks. Like you had to sell out Cipriani Ballroom, 1300 tickets. What was the first step to sell that first ticket? I mean, just, just hitting up every single person we know and saying, hey, we're trying to do something unique. We're trying to throw an event that isn't your typical bar in the Lower East Side, your typical nightclub where, you know, it's a big LED screen and you have to pay X amount to get in just to go buy, you know, drinks at the bar and be slammed on the dance floor, or pay a huge premium for a table. It's like, we came up with Cipriani and, and the desire to execute that because it's like, hey, we could do 66 tables and each table gets a three course meal and unlimited bottle service. Every general admission ticket gets open bar and past hors d'oeuvres. Like that's a unique and experience. A landmark too. It was yeah. a former New York Stock Exchange. Like this is a building with so much history. Just the building 55 Wall Street was such a important part of choosing that location for the event. So like it definitely starts with just, you know, hitting up as many people as we know, but then also when we book different artists that starts to become the community. You know, we booked Medusa as the headliner for the first Halloween event, and now there's some overlap. The fans that they have start to be informed about what we're trying to do. So by communicating with people and letting them know, hey, this isn't just you know another event where Medusa is booked, but this is something that's going to be really unique and special. We we've been able to curate really amazing crowds without being exclusive at all because we communicate the product well and we design a product for um, a sophisticated clientele. And by doing that and showing that, it kind of attracts what is meant to be attracted to it. So we don't really have to tell 
you know, like clubs in the city, Manhattan especially, very much, it's like things are cool by who they don't let in. Yeah. That's like almost like what determines what's a good nightclub in such a, a weird way. For us, it's like we kind of have this open door policy, but because we curate great products and we communicate that, what is attracted to it ends up being this really amazing, like respectful, awesome crowd of people. Yeah. And, and beyond just the venue, it's like that was Medusa's first Manhattan performance ever, um, which we were super excited about. And on top of, you know, being a landmark and you're in a room that has 150, 200 foot ceilings with huge pillars and, and a lot of ancient, you know, historical uh, art and decorations and whatnot. Like you feel like you're in a place that you're not supposed to be partying in. You're not supposed to be experiencing dance music. It's like Cipriani Wall Street, they really only do weddings, charity events, private events. It's very rare that they let promoters or organizers come in and sell to the public. Mm. So, you know, Justin for years had been trying to get an answer from them and try to let let him take over the venue and sell it. And it was kind of a dead end every time until COVID, he tried again and, you know, he was like, we have to do this. And I was like, hell yeah, we do. And we did it and it was just too unique to not do. And I think people really gravitated towards it. Wow. Wow, so a ton of great tips for organizers that are watching to unpack, as well as great behind the scenes uh, stuff for the attendees that are watching. I'm sure your guys' community didn't even know just how much has gone into scaling this over the past few years. Really quick speed round questions. You guys gotta answer these in less than 20 seconds. Biggest oh fuck moment when you were throwing an event, in the middle of the event. Got a call on the radio, desperate call. Uh, there's a fire at the main main check-in gate. Um, I jump on the golf cart, run over, and they're like, oh, someone threw a cigarette at, in the trash. It's it's out. It's totally fine. But that was like the scariest thing ever. It was year one. It was last year. Super scary. Wow. Uh, that's funny. Like, oh, fuck, you viewed an oh, fuck moment as like a what's going wrong. When I heard oh, fuck moment, I thought it was like a oh, fuck, like this is insane. So that's like that's the way, the way look, yeah. I guess maybe like I'm just like, you know, such a an optimist that sometimes when it comes yeah. to that and not the operations person that is putting out the fire. But Literally. for me, like seeing, you know, this past event, seeing like Lane 8 perform during the sunset and like the fact that we just had the most perfect sunset for that day. It could have been a cloudy day. There could have been rain. There could have been so many different things, but just it was a beautiful sunset. The lights all, you know, were working the way that we had hoped that they would. The music was amazing. And just being able to actually like put away my credential, right? And not even have my credential out, put away my credential, walk into the middle of the dance floor without having to push by one single person yeah. and just be there and just see everyone having like the absolute best time. That was kind of like the oh fuck moment. Like we're really, really, I mean, I've always felt like we were onto something, but really like that moment at this past festival was like, okay, this is like really serious what we're doing. Yeah. All right, question two one biggest piece of advice that you'd give yourself two years ago? Definitely to like be patient and be aggressive, but don't be worried about how long things are, are going to take. That, that's the number one piece of advice I would also give. It's very easy to expect things to happen right away. Just gotta be patient, realize it's a long, long-term game and you're gonna have failures. Like you're gonna have successes, but they're not gonna be successes on all fronts that you need them to be. Like you might have a success in executing the event and throwing an amazing experience. Financially, it might be tough and might take time. Some of the greatest companies and best success stories in the world have taken time. So just be patient, believe in what you're doing and just stay strong. I think another thing too I've struggled to realize and I've kind of after a few years of doing like these really di more difficult events is that you only can give 100%, and you might be able to trick yourself into thinking that you can give 110%, but I've now learned the hard way that guaranteed, if you give 110% on something, there's gonna come a time where you're only capable of giving 90, and it will end up balancing itself out. So being patient in that sense too, and just giving 100% every single day, not more, not less, I think is such an important key. Favorite artist that you guys wanna see perform besides Big JD? <laughs> For me, and this is kind of crazy, an Avicii hologram extended set. They did the Tupac hologram. He's been, Avicii one, two, three has been 
a password of mine for multiple different wow. accounts. Wow. Still is, so don't try and hack my shit. Um, <laughs> We're literally gonna get hacked. Avicii123, there's some caps and special characters, so it'll still be tough for you to figure it out, but. <laughs> there's like 20 variations I'm gonna go try right now. Right, but, uh, what's your artist? I mean, being able to do the Lane 8 three hour sunset set was an absolute dream. Like I such a big fan was actually like so biased towards it that when we put in the offer i was like i can't like this has to be you know a decision that i'm not making because I, as a fan i would do this a hundred times over so like charles go through all the economics of this like look through everything yeah. like because my opinion is totally invalid on this. no and look you definitely sure you you definitely had to convert me like i knew who he was i knew a couple songs i loved it but it just made sense like he he didn't play in the market his last time playing in the market was 2017. He was supposed to do a big space show in 2020, he got canceled because of COVID. And, you know, he kind of, he had a real cult dedicated following. So it was, it was almost a no brainer. All right, last question. Shell your guys' brands out. Where can people find you uh, on social media? And how do we find out about the next awesome We Belong Here event? Instagram is definitely our most prominent social channel, but really excited to, we're about to roll out like a V2 of our website and excited to have the website be also a little bit more of a community hub. Text message is a big way that we communicate too, especially as we're gonna start doing more events annually. So really going to our website, joining the, the insider club that we have and being the first to hear about like the cool one-off experiences that we're gonna do before anyone else does is definitely like the best way to be in the know, especially like, I, I think there's a lot of people that come to our events that are off of social media. And I think that that's like a really big growing trend. So for us, not having social media be like the core of everything we do and how we communicate with people, but being able to take things off social media so we can communicate and grow a faction of our community that is off social media and cater to them equally as the people who you know go on Instagram and manage their relationships that way. We belong here dot world. Next time you're in Miami, look up in the sky, you might see a banner flying. You're walking so by the saw water. The plane on the beach, Vante and I have seen that you guys did the like in Miami, the plane that had the sign behind it. It was nuts. All right, well, thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure to have you, and uh, we'll see you on the next hosted. Yeah, Appreciate you guys. Mwah. Much love.